Well, welcome in the name of Jesus to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. Thank you for joining us as we continue to talk about the overcoming life. And in this episode, I want to share insight from Catherine Coleman as we look at how to lay hold of that He is the Lord, our provider. You know, we look around in this hour and you can just go to a store and you see those shelves empty. And the enemy so wants to paint this picture and put such fear in you that you think, and you see inflation, you see all these things occurring, you know, where are my needs going to be met? How am I going to meet my needs? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to, and we get so filled with fear and concern that it becomes almost Lord in our lives. It really consumes us, takes us captive, and many people end up in this place of just misery. I've been there, put my hand up and say, I've been there. And I want to share what I know is a powerful message. And I'll share some testimony as the Lord leads. And I just pray that in the name of Jesus, this message would so minister to you, that it would be accurate, that it would be, Father, just from your heart, that you are the Lord, our provider. Let us lay hold of that by faith. Holy Spirit, give us eyes, see ears to hear, and a hearing heart, that we may fully receive all that you have for us. Give us a revelation of what it means that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Father, we thank you. Open the word to us and let us receive richly from the word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen and amen. I really just feel as we start this, the importance that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. He wants to honor Jesus. Our lives, because we are to walk in the Spirit. So therefore, our lives should in everything glorify Jesus. There should be no pulling of attention to us. And so we miss it, particularly in the area of the Lord being our provider, because we get so focused on us, on our desires, our thoughts, our des- you know what we, our lusts are, and we've got to lay hold of. It's about glorifying Jesus. When we get in the right place, in the right vein, in the right flow, God wants to so move. You know, there's a scripture that I've seen taken and abused so badly, and the word, of course, is that God gives power to get wealth. But that's not where it finished, that he might establish his covenant. God wants to help us so that we have the finances to fulfill the purpose. And God wants to bless us so that we can do the purpose of heaven on the earth. You know, I've discovered that if you work at a company and they give you an assignment, you need the resources to do the assignment. And God wants you to know that that you have an assignment on this earth, as long as you were here on the earth, you have an assignment from heaven, you work for the master. And God wants you to know that he cares as a good master, as a good father, for every single need you have. And he wants us to lay hold of the fact that he truly is Jehovah Jireh. In Matthew 6, verse 34, it says, Therefore do not be anxious for tomorrow, For tomorrow will care for itself each day, has enough trouble of its own. And particularly in this hour, I mean, you could get so caught up in the fear of tomorrow. And I want to so encourage you to stop feeding on the reports that are in the newspapers about tomorrow. Let the Holy Spirit give you wisdom to know what to do today. If he tells you to put some stuff aside, do that. But Keep in the place of a living relationship, feeding on the Word, and let the Holy Spirit uh, be your guide. Let Him be the voice and not the news, not the reports of men. Because all that will do is cause fear and has you focused on tomorrow, and tomorrow's not arrived. Catherine Coleman says, As you know, the Holy Spirit alone is the revealer of God's Word. And if he will break through and give you understanding concerning God's truth in these verses, I promise that it will be the beginning of a new life, a new day for you. You will become a new person. We need in the secret place to so allow the Holy Spirit to open the word. We need to have revelation knowledge. 
We cannot in this hour survive off of somebody else's revelation. You have to get into the Word and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in the secret place so that you know and you are getting hold of a truth and that truth is bigger in you, greater in you, and that it becomes an offensive weapon because it's the sword of the Spirit. So the Spirit sword has become so part of you that you use it as the Spirit leads and directs and teaches. We want those promises abiding in us so that when the threats of the enemy come, we can attack with living promises accurately released in our lives by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 6, verse 25, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing. The purpose of heaven is so much greater. And God knows, we we are told, he goes on to explain, look at the lilies of the field, look around you and see how God takes care and has met and fully provides for them. And you are more, you are everything. He specially created mankind that God could come and abide in us, find a dwelling place with us. What a thought. And he wants us to work with him that we may be co-workers, to have this wonderful relationship. And he does not just turn up and say, well, I'm a God to be served. See, many people created gods out of needs and they have these superstitions. You know, you watch baseball or some other sport, you see all these superstitions people do and this thought that if I do all these things, we get the victory. God's looking for a living relationship, not built on superstition or fear, that if I don't do this, oh my God, so that you are held captive, you can never enjoy. God wants you enjoying life every single day, filled with His peace, not abiding in the care. See, I grew up, my father died when I was five, and we moved to Northern Ireland. We actually lived in the bog side, which was a, what you would refer to as like a slum kind of area. It was not, it was a poverty area. And afterwards, you know, my, my mother, we lived off of social security. So we never had a lot of money. And I remember it was very challenging, very con- concerning at times. My mom often would walk in fear, you know, what would happen? We might lose this, we might lose the house. We didn't have a car. We never went on vacations and stuff like that. And I understand this. I remember walking with shoes with holes in. I remember having, you know, hand-me-down clothes that, you know, didn't quite fit and stuff like that. It was not easy. I remember those days. And I'm so grateful that my mother started and really started to learn to lay hold of by faith uh, her rights and privileges that she could come before the father and say, you are a husband to the widow. You are a father to the orphans. And that she understood more and more of this covenant and that God was our provider and I remember once we were in a really difficult season and she came before the Lord and said God I need a pay increase now we're surviving off of Social Security we actually were getting it from America we were growing up in Ireland living off of American Social Security it was very challenging and so she's praying and that year of course they would give a cost of living increase well all of a sudden they gave this major cost of living increase and my mother got it and it was a massive breakthrough for us just as she had prayed the answer came the next day she didn't know but see god was already working on it and god wants us to get in tune with him to ask and we as we do we'll discover he has already got the answer He's already got the provision. We just somehow think that it'll just fall into our laps, but we've got to lay hold of how to walk in the Word and to then ask and receive from Him. Catherine Coleman says, God knows there must be money to pay for groceries that we need. There is rent to pay. There's a car to be bought and gasoline to make it run. There are taxes to be met. I don't care how spiritual you are. You never get to the place spiritually where you don't have to pay these. You know, you think about sometimes that I would just love to get to where I don't have to worry about this bill. 
you know, the mortgage, the taxes, but there's always, you pay it this month and then the next month comes. And it seems that it just always comes too quick. And there again, you've got to pay these bills. Lord, where am I to get that money? Catherine went on and said, but in order to obtain these things, we need, uh, we must claim them and we must recognize God alone as the source of our supply. Lack of any kind in life of God's precious child is always traceable to the fact that he has been seeking a supply from a secondary source instead from God. God is the author and he's the giver of life and he cannot fail. Now, I love to share because, you know, the Lord had to break out of me a spirit of poverty. And that spirit of poverty always has you walking in fear of that need. You always have, I mean, there's certain fears that hold you captive that may never be real. You're always frightened of failing and not having enough. And several years ago, and of course it was the time of COVID, I lost my day job. Not only did I lose my day job, the unemployment was not being paid properly. And because of COVID, you could call, nobody picked up. So there was nowhere I could go uh, to get answers. And then the taxes, you, when you apply for, you know, you pay your taxes, well, I was owed money back. Everything was so delayed and screwed up. And it was like, Lord, I have no source. I remember walking in the garden, just talking to the Lord and saying, God, what am I supposed to do? Walking in the old way that I walked for so often, where that burden was just so heavy on my shoulders. I mean, when it gets so heavy on you, it's demonstrated in your face. It's seen in what comes out of your mouth. See, you can so discipline this confession, but what's in you, you can't. You need it changed by the Holy Spirit. I've been there where, you know, you have people spanking your tongue for saying a wrong confession. As if those words were the most important thing, but what they were not addressing was what was in the abundance in your heart. And so I would get up in the middle of the night because I didn't want family to see me seeking. I wanted them to know that God was the source. I believe the scripture in Hebrews eleven six 6, that God is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So I would get them to say, God, I'm seeking you. And I made it a custom. I found, you know, that Jesus did things. It was his custom to go at a regular time to pray. And I think that God has a custom. He wants to meet with us. You look at um, Adam and Eve that in the still there was a custom that God would meet with them at a certain time. And God has appointments for you. And I encourage you to just make a custom, not a religious thing, but your life, you're so disciplined that God, I just want to pursue you, that you know that I'll be right here at this time seeking your face. And so I, I like to get up in the middle of the night just to spend time seeking him. And I came before him and I was like, the weight of the world was my shoulders. And I'm like, God, and all of a sudden, the Lord turned up, and I knew His presence was there. And I'm like, God, you understand. And I've been trusting you. And He tried and says, I'm the master. You work for me. And I understood with that revelation, this thing, He is the Lord, our provider. If He is the provider, that means He is my source and my supply. We're going to see this from Catherine Comer. As the master, as the one whom I work for, that means he has to supply what I need to do the job and the task he's called me for. I look and say, God, I am a father. I am a husband. I have a job in ministry. These are areas that you have called me to. Therefore, I am trusting you to be my source and my supply. I'm looking to you. Catherine Coleman said this, but in order to obtain these things we need, we must claim them and we must recognize God alone as the source of our supply. Lack of any kind in the life of God's precious child is always traceable to the fact that he's been seeking his supply from a secondary source. Okay, I just said that, but I want you to get a hold of this. The problem is we have assumed our paycheck is the source. We've assumed that this or that is the source. He is. And I understood that day when I understood that 
I work for him. It didn't matter whether I have a job or not. He is my source. It didn't matter about the unemployment. He is the source and my supply. And I got a hold of that. And so I realized I have to go after him. I have to come. But see, as long as I'm carrying the care, that care becomes a stone, a block between me and him. And you've got to cast it on him because he has to be enthroned in the heart. Not a care, not a worry. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm pursuing you. And I said, I'm clinging to you. I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. I'm going to pray and seek you until inside of me, I know there's a release until I know I can go because I'm trusting you and I'm going after you. First John 4, verse 16. First John 4, verse 16. And we have come to know. And we have come to know. That takes time. And I look at that. That is not instant. That's process. That's clinging. That's a day after day going after pursuit. We have come to know and have believed. You get to a place where all of a sudden you get the revelation and you believe. The love which God has for us. See, many people walk in the revelation. God loves them, loves them, but God wants a revelation to hit you. I love you. So it starts with this clinging. It starts with the letting go. Where you look at the woman with the issue of blood. She said, if I but touch the hem of his garment. She did not stop until she did. See, Moses will say, well, if I just touch, and then we walk away. Don't quit until you touch, until you get a hold of it. Cling until you get the breakthrough. Keep pressing in and pressing through. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. That is not something that you do. You don't just come abide, leave, abide. That word abide is a command to come, do, and done. This is my place. And we've got to stop going back and forth, being double-minded. God, you're my source. I abide in you. I trust you. I look to you. And so change the way you act, the way you respond. Get proactive. You know that tomorrow needs are going to come. So seek his face earnestly. Seek his face early. Go after him and get that promise big in you. And then begin to ask and begin to declare. Let's continue. Catherine Coleman said, We are entitled to expect that God will provide for us with everything that we need because we are children of the loving Heavenly Father. And because there exists that wonderful relationship between the father and child, he will provide for our every need. Go to Joshua chapter 1. And I want you to understand this whole concept of covenant because God works through covenant. We have had a perversion for a long time where people have named it and claimed it. But get a hold of the accuracy of the right thing that he tells Joshua, and the children of Israel, go in, go. Don't stay. See, we stay. And God says, go forward. But see, there's a fear in us. There's things God tells us to do, but it takes money. We sat there recently. And God says, I want you to help this ministry. And we help them regarding something, but it costs money. And, and they were concerned about it, but I said, I'm trusting you, God. And God put in my heart, so I'm going to do it. But the money hadn't come in yet. But God says, do it. And I've learned something. Go. So I'm doing it. We just paid it. I'm on the phone with the person. And I said, I just got a check in the mail. Guess what? It just paid what was needed. It was there. I've seen this so often where God has told me to do something and I've weighed it and God has said, just go forward. So go to Joshua 1, as I said. Now he says, what? Go into the land, get your boots on the ground that I've given you. 
Now, it didn't say everywhere you put your foot, I'll give to you. It says, I've given you everywhere you put your foot. It says, I've given you land, now go put your feet on it. I've given it to you, go take a hold of it and possess it, claim it. Take it in, it is yours. I've already given it, but you have to go get boots on the ground and claim it and receive it into your life. You cannot go beyond the boundaries that I've given you. You cannot go over there, you can't go, but in the boundaries that I've given you, in the promises in the Word. See, we always want to get into, I want this, and I want that, and God says, this, stay faithful to me. Oh, but see, we're drawn by the lust of our eyes. Remember that what we're told. You have not because you ask not, or you ask amiss. If we ask according to His will, See, if you stay in the secret place and they abiding in his word, then we stay in that place of such a holy fear and we realize that God cares for you. God's not trying to just give you second best. I've discovered that God, when you lay hold of it, God always has more than enough. He will always bless you above and beyond. He never turns up with just enough. There's always more. So he's telling us, lay hold of my provision. I am your source. I am your supply. Stop looking to this or to that. Stop looking to the lust of your eye. Be satisfied. I bought somebody wants a gift. And gave it to them. They opened it. I don't like that. You ever done that? You buy somebody a gift, you know, because this is an area they say they're interested in, so you buy it. I don't like that. Take it back. I mean, and you're like, why would I give you a gift in future? You missed the whole gift thing. You missed the heart thing. And see, that's what we do. We come to the Father. I don't like that. I don't want that. And God's saying, I'm looking for a people that trust me because I always have the perfect thing. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. He wants you to lay hold of it. Go in and put your feet on and possess what he's given. If you go on in Joe, uh, Joshua chapter 1, it says, and enjoy it. Think about that. God wants you to go into land, take a hold of it, and enjoy it. Think about that, Father. Our Father, the model prayer. We're to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So I can look to heaven and I can get an understanding of God's will by what it's like in heaven. And well, what's well, just going to then fall like cherries in my life? No, we've got to pray it. We've got to lay hold of it. We've got to receive it. And we've got to claim it and walk on it. That's the accurate version of things. Catherine Coleman went on to say, I'm sorry, let me read this from 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. You have been bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Don't become slaves of things. Don't get the love of the world in you. Get a hold of the Father. See, this is where we get so wrong because we're so caught up in a wrong mindset that the Father says, I can't give you. It would ruin you. It would destroy you, make you lean. If you would trust me, delight in my will. Know that my will is perfect. It is good. I have a good land for you. Trust me. So as you abide in the secret place, you trust him. You give your all. You go after. He's everything. And this place of where you're living in a living relationship now with him, where he is Lord, he's everything. He brings you in. He brings you in. It changes. We want God on our terms. We want the Lord, our provider, on our terms. Provide my need and then I go away. That's not what God wants. God wants a living, abiding relationship. He went on in Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 8. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me in the day of trial in the wilderness. God delayed in giving. And they got all upset and they began to talk about, well, remember what it was like back in Egypt. And they completely forgot. And that's what the enemy likes to remind you. Do you remember what it was like the good old days? Well, they were not good. You just forgot. You don't remember. And may the Holy Spirit bring us true revelation of the pain, the misery, the consequences of all that we did. 
and how Father God has got something good and perfect. If we would just learn to ask, instead of asking, they complained. See, we love to come and just complain. And God's saying, learn to ask. I want to give. Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. You are the rock. You are my source. You are my supply. Get him bigger in your life. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. See, we come, you can't enter in with this care. You can't enter in with this thing bigger in your life, but you come in thankful because why he's bigger? Because he's Lord. You come in, see, we just get him and begin to really worship him, begin to exalt him. I was sitting driving the other day, and I put on some worship music, and the Lord said, turn that off, that's offending me. And what's worship music? He said, no, it's entertainment. They're entertaining. And I said, I want worship. I want something that's an outflow from your heart that seeks me, that pulls if you've been preaching, you ever preached, you go to a service and you begin to preach and people pull. I don't know how to describe it. I mean, so much more begins to come out of you. There's nothing better than being in a service where people pull. They're hungry and they're like grabbing hold of. I mean, it's just there's, it's the best service because God turns up and pours more. Pours more. God loves when we come wanting more. When we get a hold of him and we cling to him and say, God, I want more of you. You, I want you. You must be bigger in my life. You must be greater. It's not the thing. We think of the prospering as the things. And God said, the prospering is me. Because this life is but a blip. We'll spend eternity with him. We're the streets of gold. And you're worried about a big mansion, big house right now. God's saying, listen. Think about me. I look back, and I have a whole lot of people in ministry and Christian friends, and I'm not against them being financially prospering, having nice houses. You know, but someone came to me, critical of me, because all my money was put into ministry. You start a church, and people are not giving, and there's costs for rent and everything else. The ministry must have that, must be paid for. It comes from me because I had to give, I had to realize. And God initially tests and says, how committed are you? How much? And says, so like, God, it's yours. It's yours. It would offend me to have certain things because I'm like, God, I want that money given to the gospel because my heart is for you. I cannot stand there and walk in certain things. It goes on, Catherine Coleman said, in exactly the same way, we look to the Heavenly Father to supply our every need. And if we do so in faith and understanding, we shall never look in vain. Him. I want my eyes on Him. See, listen. I want, whether I have little or much, He's everything. Paul said, I learned to be content in all circumstances, whether I have or don't have, because I have Him. Some people think, if I, just, if I won the lottery and all that money, you ever read the story of some of those people? They're just as miserable, and most of them lose it, pursuing and seeking something that they can never find. He is your source of joy. He must be your source and your supply in the good and the bad in all days. Seek Him. Go after Him, because then you enjoy life. Then you're going to have a happy life, regardless of circumstances. And when you walk like that, He wants to give you more. He wants to bless you because when you're faithful in a little, he gives you more. Catherine said, it is not unusual that many men and women feel secure in themselves, believing that they will receive all things through their own efforts and as a result of their abilities. That infamous verse that we all like to quote, God helps those who help themselves, except it's not in the Bible. It's not scriptural. God's not looking for you to help yourself. God's looking for you to pursue him. God's looking for those who are obedient, recognizing Him as their source and supply. I've heard some people, well, He is my source, but my supply is this. My supply. No. I've found that God has a million ways to meet every need. I look at, we, we made a decision regarding the ministry. 
that we were not going to grovel and put messages. If you don't give, we're going under. But the ministry would be a statement of faith, an example to people that God is the Lord our provider. If I seek Him, if I'm faithful and I go after Him, then the needs we met. God would touch the hearts of the right people and they become financial partners. So we don't ask, we don't manipulate. I don't play games with people because I want my eyes on Him. I want this thing to be a witness. So I love George Mueller and he did the same with the orphanage. I believe that God can do it. And I want the, the, the ministry, which is incorporated as a person, it's a person in that sense, as a person in the sense before the Lord, He provides the need. It's God's responsibility and I trust because I want it to be a living witness. And I trust that like with the ministry of Jesus, hearts were touched and people gave. And they gave out a worship. I've been there and I've seen all the games played. I've seen all the manipulation and I've seen people's lives destroyed. Instead of it bringing them deeper and a real worship, instead of them being part of the vision and trying to do something bigger, they walk away defeated. I want something people see. And we continue to build the vision and people want to be part of that and give to that, but reaching the backsliders and we want to see the Bible school developed. I understand all these costs, but listen, God's the source and supply. And if he uses this person or that person, great. What a thought to be part of that. What a thought, what a joy to be part of that system that God's able to use you. And as you pour out, you know, he pours in. So often we don't want to give, but read the principle. As you give, more is poured back. Catherine said this, the number of possible channels through which God works is unlimited, but there's only one source, God. The particularly channel through which you are receiving your supply today may, very, may likely change, but your source will remain the same. The source is unchangeable. The source is God. He will use whatever channel He wants. He can come up with a countless number of ways to get you the money and the finances and everything else. I've shared this story, but I love it so much. I've been unemployed, I think, six, seven times. I've been there. You know, if you've been unemployed, the worst moment is when you get a job. It seems like that's when all of a sudden you, you have, but you haven't received your paycheck yet. And there's no money. And you got all this that you owe. It's terrible. And you have to trust. And I remember we were in this situation where we have ministry and we were the ones funding it. And there was no money for the rent. At the time, I think the rent was like $1,500. Unemployment was 500 every two weeks. Not enough. I have rent for my house, which was 1500. And like God, I don't have enough. We did stand up and say, we did not tell the people, listen, if you don't give the ministries over, I sat there and we just did not have the money. I'm like, Lord, we don't have the money. We're going to default on the rent this month unless you make a payment. Somebody gave a check that week that was more than enough. You know, it humbles you. I love and I take time. I, I, I honestly do. Get down and I give worship and say, God, these are yours. Bless them. I am so grateful. Some of them don't even know the timeliness of their giving. I don't care if it's a dollar, a thousand, ten thousand. I, it it's His. God met the need. We get home. And in the doorway, open it up. There's all these groceries, bags of groceries. I wanted to cry because nobody knew the timing of it, how perfect it was, but God did. He's your source. Catherine went on to say this. God is able to open another channel to supply to any of us, and the door he opens can very possibly be a better one than the very one which we're so distressed. When our trust, when I, sorry, when our trust is in God, and God cannot change or fail. And one source breaks down or falters, He simply provides from another. And if necessary, He will use angels as well as human beings to do the job. But He always supplies. I was a kid. We were growing up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. And once my mom decided to take us up to Port Rush, it was a holiday town, quite a distance away. 
and it was a very Protestant neighborhood, and the IRA had decided to do a bombing campaign that night. We couldn't get home. We had no car. We'd come by bus. We're stuck. And we're sitting there, but we prayed. And all of a sudden, this family come up in their car. And they were believers. Can you imagine? God loves believers in tune with the Spirit. And they said, we, we just feel led. Can we give you a lift home? And they drove us as far as the city. God provided. Worked a miracle. God always can. Catherine went on and said, recognize God as your source, therefore, and you will never be defeated under any circumstance. The only person that you are dependent upon is God. And when you realize that He is your source, that He is the one who supplies your daily bread, then no matter what happens, you will not be defeated. I would encourage you proactively, remember the promise in our, in our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. The children of Israel were to come and get that daily bread bread or manna there was a provision and god had wanted us to understand that pattern given so that we come every day to receive in the secret place that provision that he has made how many of us missed that divine appointment to come and receive the daily bread necessary for the needs of the day the spiritual supply the natural supply all the things met in the secret place of his presence if we would come and receive our daily bread. But we don't turn up at the divine appointment because we don't focus and realize He is our source and our supply. We need to change and we need to humble ourselves and get back before Him. She went on to say, you have a heavenly Father, He loves you. He sees you as an individual, not as one looking down and seeing a mass of humanity below. You are as a person to God, sorry, as personal to God, as though you're the only one in the whole world with a need, as though you're the only one trusting Him. You are surrounded by His tender care and everlasting love. <clears throat> you're not lost in the crowd. He knows you totally, intimately. He knows your specific needs and He knows exactly what you're like. And He's able to turn up with the right thing and He always turns up at the right time. Now, it may not be your right time, but He will never fail. He will never fail. And I just want to encourage you to learn to be a giving person because God loves to give to giving people. And one of the things that my mother started to teach us because it was a thing that really turned things around for us, she began to give. We would get up late at night and we would go and we would put bags of money together and we would stick it in believers' mailboxes or even work with people mailboxes that we knew had a need. Or we learned sneak techniques of ways of slipping money into somebody's coat pocket. In any other way, we didn't want any glory given to us. We want, didn't want people pointing to us. We wanted all the glory to go to the Lord. And it, it brought such joy to watch people testify and, and know that God met that perfect need. You will be amazed as you watch how God uses you. And how God is able to bring a testimony in somebody's life. And you were at the right place at the right time. You were in tune with the Father. God used you. And then all of a sudden, as you pour out, God pours in. God begins to meet your need. Psalm 95, 7. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, you need it today. I don't care where you were yesterday. I don't care. This relationship is always today. It's always now. And it has to be. You cannot face the battles of today with yesterday's manna, with yesterday's revelation. There's not enough strength to it. It has to be now. You need a now touch from the Father. Let me finish with this. In reality, the real source of your supply is God Himself the giver of every good and perfect gift. He is the actual source of your material supply. And when you realize that, you will feel secure because His supply to you is exhaust, exhaustless. God will never go bankrupt. And He doesn't have supply chain issues. He's never limited. God doesn't just answer prayers. He over answers. Amen.
Well, I pray this message has blessed you, encouraged you, and strengthened you, and I encourage you to check out the series on overcoming. And would you also consider becoming a prayer partner? For more information, go to robertpairs.org. Don't put a www in the front, just go to robertpairs.org or go to godsgeneralsandrevivals.com and learn about what we call the partners because we don't ask for money. We're just looking for prayer partners because there's power in that. Now, if God puts in your heart to give financially, you can give at the, the, donate, the, the donate page on the website. If this message has truly blessed you, and I pray that it has, I would ask you, would you please like, share, and subscribe? Because as you do, you really help us with the algorithms at YouTube and Google. And you know, as you check that, that uh, little bell, the alarm button, you'll be alerted when we have more messages. And we try to get about two to three per week, if not more, different messages to really help you live boldly for Jesus in this hour. Amen. We'll be blessed. Be encouraged. Remember, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because of, through, and for Him. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.